Hello. Just as prehistorians find lithics to be among their most important kinds of artifacts, for much of later prehistory as well as the historic periods, archaeologists find pottery to be one of their key artifact classes. In today's video, I'd like to talk to you about some of the kinds of observations that archaeologists make on pottery, some of which tell us things like how the pots were made or how they were fired. And in some cases, they can also tell us things about how the pots were used, what was contained inside of them and occasionally even give us clues to identity of the people who made or used the pots. One of the reasons that pottery is so important in archaeology is that it's often both abundant and remarkably well-preserved, sometimes even as substantially whole vessels. It's much more common for it to occur in the form of fragments called sherds, but even then it's possible in many cases to refit these sherds into fairly large proportions of a whole vessel. The analysis of pottery often begins in field laboratories, where archaeologists wash the sherds and then sort them into vessel types and fabric groups. It may continue at laboratories in museums, universities, or CRM offices, where there's equipment and space for carrying out more sophisticated kinds of analyses. Archaeologists have a specialized vocabulary for describing pottery. First, they visualize vessels with a sort of cutaway view that allows them to describe the exterior, interior, and cross-section of the pot simultaneously. Although there's some variation from project to project, archaeologists have a vocabulary for describing the segments of pots, starting at their lip or rim at the top, down to the base at the bottom. Other common segments are handles and spouts. When examining pottery, there are a number of questions we can ask, many of which we can answer simply with naked eye observations or under low power magnification. Typically, the first thing to do is to decide what segment a sherd represents. Archaeologists typically pay particular attention to rims, but also to some extent to bases and handles. If the segment is a rim or a base, we can use a diameter chart to get some sense of the vessel's overall size. The arcs on a diameter chart are spaced in increments of a half centimeter of radius, which is equivalent to one centimeter of diameter. In the case of rim sherds, we measure either interior or exterior diameter, depending on the shape of the sherd. Here we'll use the interior. We line up one broken edge of the rim with the y-axis of the graph, and then we move it up and down until we find a pretty good fit to one of the arcs. We have to be careful not to be misled by some chipping that occurs at the left edge here. Notice that we hold the shirt at stance, meaning that the entire lip of the vessel is in contact with the chart. In this case, the best fit appears to be to the arc for 19 centimeters of diameter. We can also use the diameter chart to measure the preservation of the vessel in terms of the proportion of the entire circumference of the vessel orifice. In this case, very slightly under 20%. While stancing a rim shirt on a diameter chart, we can't help but notice the angle between the rim and the horizontal plane. This allows us to distinguish three very basic vessel shapes. Outward leaning or everted vessels, inverted vessels, and vertical vessels. When we're lucky enough to have further information, we may even be able to classify the overall shape of the vessel. Some common general shape categories appear here. Bowls are often everted, and their height tends to be less than their diameter. By contrast, jars tend to be taller than they are wide, and they typically have constricted orifices, meaning that their rim diameters are less than their body diameters. Jars often have necks, but there are also unnecked jars, sometimes called whole mouth jars. Some vessels, like this salt glaze crock, have cylindrical shapes. Platters and plates are vessels that are so everted that they're virtually flat. Then there are more unusual vessel shapes, like lamps and stands. Finally, there are ceramic artifacts that are not vessels at all, such as roof tiles, figurines, and spindle whorls. The next step may be to examine the fabric of the sherd. It's important to examine the broken edges, and you might want to use a tile pincer to break off a small bit of the edge if it's obscured by carbonates or dirt. In some cases, we actually saw the sherds vertically to create a cross-section, 
especially if we plan to use thin sections for petrographic analysis. Once the thin slice is removed in order to make the thin section, we can still make use of these leftover halves of the shirt uh, to make some macro observations on it, as well as to make it easier for us to draw the pottery. We can use a precision saw to slice a vertical or radial section through a, through a shirt, and we can also slice uh, tangential or transverse sections as well if we think that will be useful. Uh, we, we slice it once and then we slice it again so that we get a, a thin kind of slab of the pottery separated from the, from the vessel. So there's a, there's a gap here where one of those has been removed. Uh, and then we mount it on a glass slide and then polish it down until it's only 30 microns thick. And that get, allows us to mount it on a microscope and have light actually go right through, this, through the slide so that we can see what kind of minerals and other kinds of things are, there might be in, in that uh, section. To do the petrographic analysis, we mount the slides on a polarizing microscope with a circular stage that allows us to rotate the slides. Today, we also typically use image analysis software to study each slide. When doing petrography, it's often desirable to estimate the density of one of the particle types in among the inclusions, or the ratio of one inclusion type to another. A good way to do this while viewing thin sections is through a method called PPS sampling, which stands for probability proportional to size. In this method, you count how many particles are intersected by a grid of crosses or lines on a reticule or computer screen. However, because large particles are far more likely to be intersected than small ones, you have to make corrections in order to avoid bias in your estimates. One very important aspect of examining pottery is to look for traces of how the vessel was made. Of the primary forming methods, the simplest and crudest are pinching and drawing, which can leave impressions of the potter's fingers. In shirts from coil-built pots, you can sometimes detect the boundaries between coils, either in tangential view or in a broken cross-section. Vessels may also tend to fracture along coil boundaries. Similarly, Shirts from slab belt pots can show joins between the slabs or signs of attempts to hide those with finishing methods. Shirts made with wheel fashioning, such as thinning and shaping the walls of a coil belt vessel on a so-called slow wheel, can be tricky to identify because some of their traces look very similar to the traces on wheel thrown pots. However, wheel thrown pots do have some very distinct features. This particular vessel is pretty clearly wheel made. You can see the rilling on the body of the, of the vessel that comes from the potter's fingers while the main body of the vessel is turning on the wheel. You can also see that there are parallel ridges on the neck of the vessel. The rim is slightly off circular and again has kind of rilling around it. And of course the strap handles were added later on after it was thrown on a, web, on a wheel. And if we examine the base, you can again see signs that the vessel was turned upside down and then the base was finished on the wheel also. On the interior side of base sherds, one tends to get a distinct spiraling that happens right near the bottom. Using a string or wire to cut off a vessel while it's turning on a wheel leaves distinct traces on the base. The curvature of the drag marks varies with the speed with which the wheel is turning. However, subsequent forming of the base can remove these traces. Molding can be as simple as pressing clay into an existing bowl or over the top of an upside down bowl, but tends to be used for more complex shapes that need to be pieced together or that have high relief. When molded vessels do have high relief, it's important to shape that relief in such a way that it's tapered so it can be removed easily from the mold. In classical archaeology, lamps are good examples of mold-made vessels. Because they're made in two-piece molds, they show a seam around the edge, or traces of having the seam removed. This leads nicely into the topic of secondary forming methods. One of those methods is joining which can involve joining together the pieces of mold-made vessels, but more commonly just involves adding handles and spouts and so on to vessels. In this cross-section through a handle, we can see how the handle was attached and then smeared into the body of the vessel, leaving a void 
using beading to thin the walls of a coil or slab built vessel can leave flattened facets on the surface. It can also lead to spider-like cracks around big inclusions on the surface and a laminar structure that may cause flakes of the vessel wall to spall off. Here in section we can even see cracks that run parallel to the vessel walls. Thinning the walls by scraping it with a flint flake or some other tool may cause short longitudinal marks, including drag marks caused when the scraper drags certain particles along its path. Trimming with a knife or similar tool is particularly noticeable where people have tried to remove the seams from vessels that were made in multiple part molds. Turning can leave similar traces, except that they occur in a spiral pattern due to the lathe-like action of the turning wheel. Finishing methods alter the appearance of the vessel without substantially altering its shape. Smoothing can result in a kind of wiped appearance of the surface, but burnishing results in a much more noticeable smoothing that gives the surface a very glossy appearance. Impressing the surface with a stick or tool or fingernail while the surface is still plastic leaves really obvious traces. While rolling a cord wrap stick or other roulette across the surface leaves a repeating pattern. Incising the surface with a sharp tool tends to displace material towards the end of each stroke. While the most obvious evidence for piercings and cuttings tend to be the perforations themselves. In some cases, small raised rings around the hole on one side and none on the other show that the holes were made by piercing with a pointed stick. Applied decoration, or applique, results in raised areas on the vessel walls, generally either for decorative purposes or to disguise seams between pieces that have been joined. A slip occurs as a distinct layer on top of the vessel surface, sometimes, but not always, differing from the underlying fabric in color. When they do differ in color, often as a result of firing conditions, they can be used to create painted decoration on the surface, although painting can also use colored pigments. Glaze is quite easy to recognize because it consists of a distinct layer of glass on the surface of the pot. Many of these finishing methods, alone or in combination, are used to create decoration on a vessel's surface. As the analysis of decoration is a complex topic, we'll leave that for another video. Some of the features we can observe on pottery give us clues as to whether it was fired in a kiln or an open fire, and whether the atmospheric conditions were reducing or oxidizing. The shirt shown here, for example, has uneven firing with patches of reduced and oxidized areas that probably results from firing in an open fire. This shirt is evenly fired all the way through, showing that it was fired in a kiln with an oxidizing atmosphere, while this one shows much the opposite, being oxidized on the outside but very reduced on the interior, indicating an incomplete firing. This shirt has a very thin oxidized layer on the exterior, but is otherwise reduced all the way through. Most likely it was originally fired in a reducing atmosphere, but then refired in an oxidizing one after the application of an exterior slip. One attribute of pottery that we're interested in is its firing temperature. And a very simple method for uh, estimating that firing temperature is one that involves refiring the shirt to see at what temperature it charts to make chemical changes. This method depends on the fact that as, as uh, pottery goes through a firing in a kiln and reaches higher and higher temperatures, certain chemical changes happen to the fabric of the pottery at certain temperatures. So for example, the silicates and the clay in the pottery undergoes changes that we can recognize, it's physical changes, of which some of the more obvious ones are changes in color that will vary depending on whether you have an oxidizing or reducing atmosphere inside the kiln, but the shirt can get redder or blacker or grayer or something like that. One way we can attempt to estimate the firing temperature then is to take a pot shirt and either snap it in half or find two pot shirts that already fit together and clearly come from the same vessel uh, and that are apparently the same color and so on. Um, and this is one reason that it's good to have a sample of body shirts from the site. Some archaeological projects save all pottery, whether they're body shirts, rims, bases, or whatever. Some projects tend to uh, sample mainly or even exclusively rims, bases, and handles. 
Uh, and, but it's always a good idea to include some body sherds in your sample because then they can be used for destructive analysis. And the method I'm describing today is a destructive method because first of all, we want to take a larger sherd and snap it in half because we're only going to refire half the sherd. Uh, or we can find two that fit together. But the point is the one that we refire is going to go through fundamental changes that change the character of that pottery. And it's one of those rare cases where we, want, where we need to ignore a uh, basic conservation ethic, which is kind of do no harm, don't make any changes to the sure that can't be reversed. Because when we fire this to a higher temperature, that can never be reversed. We can never change it back to what it looked like uh, when it was not fired to that high temperature. So what we do is we take the two halves of the sure, we keep one of them aside, so it's our kind of reference sure that we're going to use to compare against what, after we refire this half of the sure. And uh, we'll fire that sherd to a somewhat low temperature, you know, perhaps a little, a little below or somewhat below what we suspect would be the lower range of the probable firing temperature for the pottery. We fire it in a kiln for a few hours, allow the kiln to cool down, then open up the kiln, take the sherd out, and then we compare the two sherds to see if there are any changes. Most likely there will not be at this point because we fired it only at a very low temperature. It will only start to undergo changes once it exceeds the temperature at which it was fired. For refiring the sherds, we could use a simple lab kiln like this one you see here, but it would be kind of labor intensive because this one doesn't have good thermostatic control, instead it just has this analog reader here, so we have to pay attention very carefully and watch the needle as it rises. And then we have to shut the kiln off manually when it reaches the temperature we want. And it probably will still continue to rise for a little while, so it's hard to be very precise about the temperatures that we're going to try out to see if the pottery goes through any changes during the firing. This kiln is much better for our purposes because it has electronic control over here that allows us to program the kiln so that it rises, the temperature inside the kiln will rise to a certain temperature and hold stable at that temperature for an extended period of time before eventually lowering again to uh, room temperature so that we can remove the shirt from the kiln. Now ordinarily, especially with a kiln this large, we'd be doing a lot more than one shirt at a time. This would be pretty wasteful to do it one at a time, but for demonstration purposes, uh, that will do. I should also mention health and safety is very important with kilns because they get extremely hot, obviously, so we need to be very careful not to open the kiln while it's in operation. Uh, even when we're pretty sure that everything is down to room temperature, we want to still wear uh, protective gloves and so on when you're taking things out of the kiln. And I'm just going to open it up here so you can see what it looks like inside. Uh, they often have what's called kiln furniture, so you can arrange pots or something in here during firing. Small ones down here and large ones on top, for example. But for our purposes, we're just going to take our little shirt and we'll put it on top of the top shelf there and close the kiln up. And then we use the controller over here. It's now started it on the program that I preset, and it will rise to that temperature. You can hear the kiln starting to operate now. It will rise to that temperature, which I think I've set for 500 degrees, and hold it at that temperature for, I think, two hours before it reduces to room temperature again. So we'll have to come back later. After a relatively low temperature refiring of the shirt on the left, we see no difference in the color of the shirt. So we now refire it yet again at a somewhat higher temperature, let it cool off, make a comparison with, the, with, the, with its partner shirt, uh, and repeat this process at slightly higher temperatures, you know, perhaps in 50 degree Celsius increments or something like that, until we take the shirt out, we compare them, and one of the shirts is noticeably different, the, the shirt we refired is notably different from the shirt that we held in reserve. So for example, it could change color. Here we again see that shirt on the left unchanged after a refiring to 1050 degrees Celsius. And here, after firing to 1100 degrees, the shirt on the left has changed color. This allows us to estimate the firing temperature as about 1075 degrees Celsius. If we look at it more carefully, we'd also notice other changes, like some of the minerals in the pottery will have changed as well. But uh, color is obviously a, a pretty easy indicator, and uh, so we can watch for that. It will depend, however, on the atmospheric conditions inside the kiln.
Sometimes damage to or residues on potsherds can give us some clues as to the use of the vessel, such as soot accumulated on the walls of cooking pots. For example, this ethnographic cooking pot has little chips in the bottom that come from resting on stones in the fire. Uh, it also has spalling on it in various places, which probably was a result of heat expansion. So when this was heated up, uh, little inclusions in the paste of the, of the pot probably kind of blew out of the side of the pot. Um, so that probably is suggestive of having been used on a fire. Uh, there's also a certain amount of soot in some places on the exterior of the pot. Typically, pottery analysis also involves assigning sherds to standardized classes in a classification. As there's not time to cover that here, I refer you to my other video on archaeological typology. In a busy lab with lots of people making observations on pottery, it's important to have quality assurance protocols to ensure that the data collected are consistently accurate and valid. In some archaeological labs, in order to help the people working in the lab make consistent uh, attributions of various attributes on artifacts, we use a kind of guidebook or pro a protocol that's recorded on a binder or something like that, and, and uh, people working in the lab go step by step through the pages in the binder to help them record the attributes on the artifacts. So in this particular instance, we'll look at pottery. So we have here a, a manual of sorts uh, that has little diagrams and drawings and so on to help the people in the lab assign the attributes correctly and accurately uh, to each artifact, in this case, sherds. Another useful element of quality assessment and control is the use of regular audits by a lab manager or an outside expert. We can then use control charts to show trends in the average difference between the auditor and lab personnel to see if there are any problems arising or times when these differences exceeded the upper control limit, which represents our tolerance on accuracy in the lab. The video you just saw emphasized the kinds of observations you can make on pottery using either your naked eye or low power magnification. And they can tell you about things like how the pots were constructed and fired, and in some cases, uh, how they may have been used or what they were used to contain. There's a host of other kinds of analyses that archaeologists conduct on pottery, some of them coming from archaeometry, things like chemical analyses of the paste or chemical analyses of residues that show what kinds of materials were stored or cooked inside a pot. Uh, and we didn't have time to cover those today. We could also talk about the analysis of the decoration that's on pottery in terms of structuralism or something like that. Again, a topic that we didn't have time to discuss today. If you'd like to explore some of these topics in more detail, you can check out Chapter 12 of my book, The Archaeologist Laboratory, published by Springer, and also the sources cited in there. I also draw your attention to Prudence Rice's book, Pottery Analysis, a Source Book. Thank you, and stay safe.